from Luke's gospel, the sixth chapter. These that Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Plain. The Sermon on the Plain is similar to the Sermon on the Mount, but we don't often hear the Sermon on the Plain. It's shorter than the Sermon on the Mount, but Jesus gives to us instructions for living, and he ends this sermon with these words. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? I'll show you what it's like when someone comes to me, hears my words, and puts them into practice. It's like a person building a house by digging it deep and laying the foundation on bedrock. When the flood came, the rising water smashed against the house, but the water couldn't shake the house because it was well built. But those who don't put into practice what they hear are like a person who built a house without a foundation. The flood water smashed against it, and it collapsed instantly. It was completely destroyed. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I admit that I come to you today with a heavy heart. Our congregation has experienced a lot of loss in the last several weeks. We have had families affected by seeing their children die. We have had families affected by seeing their spouse die. We have had families affected by seeing their siblings die. And we have had families affected by seeing their classmates, their beloved friends, their soulmates die. The scripture lesson before us today tells us that when we build our lives on the firm foundation of knowing that Jesus is our Lord, difficulties can come to us in life and they will not sweep us away, but we will still be able to stand firm. My dear sister Debbie was my sister all of my life. She is my oldest sister, and she was my soulmate for many, many years until she was afflicted with mental illness And I became, in many respects, one of her caregivers. In these last days, as she laid in the bed at Baptist Hospital, I found myself singing to her over and over again, Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me home. I sang those words to her and I would stop and I would tell her, that I knew she was tired and she was weak and she was worn. And that when she heard Jesus calling her name to not be afraid, but to take his hand and he would lead her home, home to where our father already rests in Jesus's presence, home to where so many other beloved family and friends are resting with Jesus. But as I sang those words to her, and I thought about this sermon series we were doing about the ways we know Jesus, I found it interesting that that song says, Precious Lord, not Precious Jesus. And I wondered, what does that really mean to call Jesus our Precious Lord? 
And if Jesus does not defeat death by eliminating it, but by transforming it, what does it mean now for me and for all of us who are grieving? To sing for the precious Lord to take our hands because we are tired too and we are weak and we are weary and we need to be led on to see the light of the Lord in our midst. So Christine is right. The scripture lesson for us today encourages us to live the life that Jesus called us to live. But I realize that the only way we can live the life that Jesus calls us to live and to understand Jesus as our Lord is if we first have experienced Jesus in our lives. And that maybe instead of the title being the Jesuses I have known, I should have titled this series The Way Jesus Makes Himself Known. For that is the reality that Jesus comes to us in various ways through the journey of life, meeting us in the ways that we need Jesus in our life at that particular time. When we need healing, Jesus comes to us as Savior, and I thank Evelyn for such a wonderful message to us last week for standing in for me and reminding us that Jesus not only saves us from sin and death, but Jesus saves us wherever we need healing in this world. Jesus comes to us as friend whenever we need to know that we are not alone. And I thank Austin for leading us in that message two weeks ago in my absence and reminding us that Jesus is that friend who comes to us so that we do not walk this road of life alone, but Jesus is always there for us. Jesus will come to us as teacher when we need to grow in our faith and in our understanding but Jesus also comes to us as Lord, the one who has authority and power and strength when our strength is weak, and the one who can give us the power we need to face the difficult challenges in life. This title, Lord, is packed with meaning. And if you are engaged in the small group study with Christine Haight or have read through Diana Butler Bass's book, Freeing Jesus, you will understand that there is much about this title, Lord. It's historic meaning and what it means for us. But I want to share with you today how Jesus came to me as Lord in these last few days. How Jesus reveals himself as Lord when we are grieving. For Jesus comes to us as one with strength and one with power and one with grace so that we might know how we can be strength and power and grace in the lives of others. And so I want to do so by looking at how Jesus First, to two disciples who themselves were grieving, grieving. This story is told for us in Luke's gospel in the 24th chapter, beginning with the 13th verse. It says, on that same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. This is on the day of Easter morning. On that day, they get out of town to distance themselves from the pain and grief that they are feeling. 
They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. And while they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey. And they were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? And they stopped, their faces downcast. The one named Cleopas replied, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who is unaware of the things that have taken place over the last few days? He said to them, What things? They said to him, The things about Jesus of Nazareth. Because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But... Our chief priest and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago, but there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned, for they went to the tomb early this morning, and they did not find his body, and they came to us saying that they had seen a vision of angels who told them that he is alive. Some of us who were with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had said. They did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people. Your dull minds keep you from believing all that the prophets talked about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then to enter his glory? And then he interrupted for them, and then he interpreted for them the things that were written about himself in all the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets. And when they came to Emmaus, he acted as if he was going on ahead, but they urged him, saying, Stay with us, it's nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in, and he stayed with them, and he took his seat at the table with them, and he took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But he disappeared from their sight. And they said to each other, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and he proclaimed to us and explained the scriptures for us? And they got up right then and they returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their companions gathered together and they were saying to each other, the Lord really has risen. He appeared to Simon and then to the two disciples as they described what had happened along the road and how Jesus was made known to them as he broke the bread. Amen. So I ask you, have any of you been to Emmaus? I know that Ann Jessup and Carl and Cheryl Evans, Jetty Hunt, y'all went to the Holy Land with me. We didn't go to Emmaus. Has anybody been to Emmaus? Don Britt's been to Emmaus. I'm not surprised that no one else has. Because let me tell you what I've learned. No one's exactly sure where Emmaus is. So... There are lots of places in the Holy Land region that proclaim to be Emmaus, and that's probably one of the places Don went to. But no one knows for sure if those places really are Emmaus. And so it's interesting to me that this story that I just read to you is one that you probably knew the minute I started reading it. You've heard it over and over again, for the church loves this story. We keep the story alive. We talk about these two disciples going to this place called Emmaus, but we don't know where Emmaus is. But let me tell you what theologian and author Frederick Beekner says Emmaus is. 
He describes Emmaus this way. He says, it is the place we go in order to escape our pain. A bar, a movie, Emmaus may be buying a new suit or a new car. It may be smoking cigarettes or it may be going to church on Sunday. Emmaus is wherever you go to make yourselves forget the pain that you are feeling. So let me ask you again, have any of y'all been to Emmaus? All of us. All of us have been to Emmaus, and that is why this story resonated with me. For it is at Emmaus that these two disciples met and understood that Jesus is Lord of their life. So I want us to look today at what we can learn from these two disciples and what they can teach us when we experience pain in our lives. The story starts out that the two disciples were on their way to Emmaus when Jesus joined them. In other words, grief is always a journey. It's a process. It doesn't end overnight. There is never a moment when we can say we are totally all over our grief that this one experience of grief will no longer affect us, for grief will always affect us. When we grieve, our lives are changed forever by that experience, and grief is a process of learning how to live with the loss that we have experienced, for grief means really that something important to us is now no longer with us. It is missing from our lives. Whether it is a person or a dream or a place or an experience, grief is always loss, significant loss, and it changes our life forever, and it is a journey to get to the place to understand what our future will look like in this new reality. What does the future hold is the question of that journey. Now, I know some people try to heal us when we are grieving. They try to stop our crying. I think I frightened my daughter, Michelle, yesterday at the hospital for when I knew that Debbie was about to pass. Michelle sent a text to our dear friend, Emil Mitchell, who is a social worker with hospice, and she said, Mom is having a meltdown. And Emile told me later, she said, I don't think Michelle is used to seeing her mom fall apart like that. But I knew you were doing what you needed to do because grief is a journey. And as I tell people all the time, God gave us tear ducts for a reason. Don't be afraid or embarrassed about using them. Grief does not mean a lack of faith. Grief and tears do not mean a lack of courage or weakness. Grief is a journey. And it causes us to lament and cry over our losses. The second thing that I noticed is that these disciples are traveling together. They're not traveling alone. They are traveling together. When we journey through grief, we need others who will listen to us and travel that road with us. And that is why I began my announcements today with a word of thanks to you because I know that you travel this road with me. Austin actually volunteered to preach today, but I told her part of my grieving is I have to keep on doing and work through it. 
We need companions along the way that we know we can count on who will just be there with us and listen to us share those stories of our loved ones. That's what they were doing. They were sharing their experiences. They weren't afraid and pretending that Jesus had never entered their life. They were talking about him and talking about how they loved him and how they had hoped that he would be their Messiah. And Jesus, you notice, appears in their midst as they are walking. The scriptures tell us that wherever two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, he appears in the midst of them, and I truly believe that is true. For when you walk the journey of grief with others, somehow, mysteriously, they can also feel the presence of Jesus, their Lord, who gives them power and strength, their Savior, who brings healing to their hearts. They can feel the presence of Jesus in their midst when we do that, even though they may not recognize it at the time. And so these travelers get to Emmaus, and it looks like this stranger they do not recognize is going to keep on going, but they compel him to stay and to eat with them, and so he does. And he takes on the role of host, for he is the one who blesses the meal and takes the bread and breaks it in their presence. And when he does, the scripture says they recognize this stranger is Jesus. And all of a sudden, they are filled with hope. For you see, when our friends journey with us and we feel God's presence and we recognize God's presence in the midst of our grief and our pain, we are filled with hope. Hope that we can go on. Hope that God has not abandoned us and left us in our pain alone, but that God can transform and that God has promised that death is not the end of us, but love is. Think about it. Nothing in these two disciples' reality had changed. They still have to live with the cross in their past. They still have to live with the reality that the tomb is empty. They cannot rewind history and pretend it never happened. They cannot return to their relationship with Jesus the way it was before. For right after he breaks the bread and they recognize him, he disappears. The reality of Good Friday changed their lives forever. But because Jesus is Lord and Savior, because they felt his presence that day, they experienced new hope that allowed them to move forward in life. It is that hope, my friends, that we can bring to one another, the hope that Jesus is Lord and has not left us in our grief. It is that hope that we can share with one another. So the last lesson that I take from these two disciples that I want to impart to you today is that that passage ends by saying they left immediately and went back to Jerusalem. Now, why is that odd? Because what time of day was it? It was nighttime. They had just walked seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and Jesus was going to walk on, but they said, no, don't walk on. It's nighttime. Stay with us. Eat with us. And now they were filled with new energy and new hope. And they want to run right back that seven miles again to Jerusalem to tell the others that they know that Jesus is Lord and will take care of all of them, that Jesus is alive and at work, that death and struggle and pain does not mean that God is not active and that God has abandoned us. We feel pain because we have loved, and love never ends. That promise calls us to reach out likewise and to go and to share with others. 
which brings me back full circle to Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Plain, that if we call Jesus our Lord, we will do what Jesus did. We will share with others about the ways that Jesus has come to us and impart hope to them. We will walk with them as Jesus walked with these disciples. We will walk with them in their journey of grief, and we will listen to their stories of their beloved one and their pain, and we will help them to know that they are not alone. My dear friends, I thank you once again for journeying with me and for journeying with all who travel this road of grief. And I pray that I will have the strength and the courage to always be there for you as well, that we might truly follow Jesus as our Lord, not only with the words of our mouth, but with the actions of our life. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, may it be so for you and for me. Amen and amen.